and then I realise I've got the wrong glasses on. It, I mean, I would leave them, but they're literally like head. Like, fuck's sake. Do it again then. Hello and welcome to the bazaar. Today I didn't have anything prepared as such and I say that because there's a lot of different things I want to make episodes about but I'm sort of in the middle of research for them. So with that in mind I thought well I don't want to miss an episode, what should I do? So what I've decided to do is get like a random five games that I like, well, not random, use five games I like and, and put them back on your radar and hopefully take games you might not have thought about for a while and made you want to play again. That's the point. That's, 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 that's what we're going to try and do here today. So here's the, here's the games. Vikings Wolves of Midgard is technically speaking an ARPG. That puts it in the absolute same category as Torchlight 2 or Victor Vran. But because it's played with a controller, or at least it's designed to be primarily played with a controller, your actions are transmitted to the screen in a much more brawler-like fashion. It's got more in common with Shadow of Mordor than it does with Torchlight 2. This is an interesting dynamic for a ARPG. It causes you to feel really connected. It causes you to seriously feel what you're doing. And because of that, you're able to respond in a more one-to-one -one fashion. You can slam right on the controller to, to just roll at just the right time. You can come behind someone and smack them with a stick. It feels really like a brawler, but it is kind of an ARPG in the sense that you're picking up loot that drops and you're progressing through larger and larger and progressively more difficult maps. It's an interesting hybrid that I've really enjoyed. And it was published in 2017. Um, it was by Game Farm was the developer and Calypso Media Digital was the uh, publisher. It's priced at the moment on Steam at £22.99, and it gets mixed reviews, and I feel it's because it straddles that middle ground between the two genres that people don't really take to it, but I think it's really good, and to be honest, it is so pretty. I mean, the levels, you're zoomed, where in ARPGs, you're zoomed quite far out. With Walls of Midgard, you're right in there. You feel really sort of close to that character, and because of that, you are rolling and dodging and hitting. And I just think it's a really nice balance that's often overlooked. And the reason it's on today's list is because it's a game that people don't really talk about. It's not one that people keep, you know, I don't see people streaming. I don't see people talking about it. But it's great. It's a really, it's a really great game. And I enjoy it a lot. Dungeon Rushers is a game of two halves. The first half is a exploration game where you explore a dungeon with a little counter piece and then you get into um, events. The events are structured like the old RP tactical RPGs where you got your guys on one side and their guys on the other side and you take turns making decisions of combat. Um, it's a very, 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 very polished game. It looks beautiful while at the same time being oddly cheerful even though you're exploring a dungeon. Um, the game is quite long and it does encourage you to to get all the XP you can out of a dungeon, which is where it shines because if you find the exit to the dungeon really quickly, you can move on to the next dungeon, but you may want to carry on exploring that dungeon to try and get the maximum XP and loot out of it. So it's constantly a balancing act deciding which, you know, whether you're going to run the risk or whether you're going to move on. Um, the characters that you discover through the game uh, aren't all discovered in the same order. I mean, each playthrough you may find them in different orders and things. But uh, it is a superbly interesting game. I found it really rewarding to play. I like the combat. Even when I feel like I'm grinding because I'm, I'm trying to get all the XP out of a dungeon, each fight is interesting. Each fight is consistently interesting you find new ways of doing things and you find new ways of you of, of timing character attacks and things it's a very interesting game very enjoyable game lovely soundtrack lovely visuals and really there's nothing bad to say about it and the reason i'm hammering home how much i like it here is because it's got mixed reviews on steam which i find really odd i don't understand why it's got mixed reviews because i i can't see a lot to dislike about this game um it's also got this weird multiplayer where you can like make a dungeon and people can invade um it feels lovingly done and it doesn't feel tacked on, but it's not the reason I play the game. So I've stuck mostly to the single player progression and really enjoyed it. So much so I've even purchased the Android version so I can play in my pocket. Play in my pocket? Wow, someone should, someone should copyright that phrase. 
It says, Android, play in your pocket. Well, maybe they have, actually, now I think about it. Uh, anyway, Dungeon Bridges is by Goblins Studios, and it's published by Goblins and Whisper Games. Um, it's priced usually at £10.99. Um, there is DLC for this game, but it is literally outfits of the characters that have no bearing on anything. They're priced at £1.59 each, and there is not loads of them. They are quite re there's like four of them at time of recording and there's no dlc there's no microtransactions there's no nonsense this is a nice and pure crawler where you play you pay and then you just you just play you don't have to worry about microtransactions which is nice because i kind of feel like it would be really easy like low-hanging fruit for them to implement microtransactions i'm really pleased they didn't because it would have turned me off but yeah dungeon rushers it's great long live the queen is a visual novel of sorts an anime visual novel where you have to use your normal visual novel techniques of progressing story. However, on the side of that, you're also choosing what she spends her free time doing and what she studies in school. Um, this gives her skills. Those skills decide whether or not she survives and has the skills to defeat people when she, no doubt, gets an assassination attempt. Because this game is filled with things that are trying to kill you. And the decisions you make of what skills she picks up is how she stays alive. It's an interesting balancing act because you're trying to progress this story that's genuinely engaging, but you're always trying in the back of your mind to push it in the direction of the skills that you've got. This can often be the thing that actually works against you. Now, as I said, this game's been around since 2013, and it's got something of a cult following. It's got overwhelmingly positive on Steam, and all the people that have heard of it praise it to high heavens. People love this game. But not enough people seem to know about this game, which is why it's on my list, I suppose. It's an awesome experience, and it does things with visual novels back in 2013 that even now no visual novel has done. The Linux port of the game is beautifully put together, and I've never had a problem with it. Long Live the Queen is one of the best games ever. It is really, really great. I mean, like, I, I couldn't make a top 10 of games, but if I made a top 100, it would be ranked awfully high. Um, it is so engaging and so interesting, and it combines decision-making that really matters with visual novels. And I love visual novels. Um, my only criticism always is they're quite passive, and this sorts that out in a way that I really wish more would do. Long Live the Queen is awesome. It's published by... Hanako Games and developed by Hanako Games. It's priced at £6.99 and it is worth every penny. Space Tyrant, published and developed by Blue Wizard Digital, is this really interesting grand strategy game. Basically, if you take Master of Orion or Stellaris and then you turn it into a more of an arcade experience, the end result is Space Tyrant. The graphics are hugely cartoony, but that's to give it this unified, accessible look. And I think it really suits it, and it's so well polished. Um, basically, it takes all the key points of these grand strategy 4X type games, and it just makes it into this really easy to understand experience where you're taking control of planets and each time you take control of a planet you have more resources. You've also got fleets of ships that you can just add to and take away from using currency. And then you attack things to take them over. Um, you also have this card mechanic that gives you perks throughout the game. Um, you spend energy to do that and you have research which constantly upgrades your ships. It is a really enjoyable experience that has the right amount of depth. There are too many games that don't have enough depth. There are too many games where it's it, it's just like it, it, as soon as you start playing it, you suddenly realize its flaws. Or then there's the opposite end of the spectrum with something like Stellaris where you can get kind of lost in the sheer amount of stuff going on. Space Tyrant strikes the balance wonderfully in that. And I would think if you've never played a 4X or Grand Strategy type thing, um, this is a great start because it introduces all the ideas that are in the larger, more more deep games. More deep, that's probably, anyway. It introduces all these ideas while at the same time um, keeping it so you can understand it. So it's a great stepping stone into this genre, which I really liked. And I think, really, um, Blue Wizard Digital need to be praised because they've made a wonderful product. Um, it's priced at £14.99 on Steam. It has very reasonable requirements because of the art style there. And I would be surprised if anyone doesn't like this. I mean, look at it. If the art if the art style appeals to you and you like the fact it's got a button that says Death Ray, just buy it. It's great. It's, it's really good. It's, it's one of the ones I can't recommend. Well, it's, it's on this list, obviously, is why. Monolith is a top-down bullet hell shooter with a retro aesthetic. Now, 
I like retro aesthetics. I love pixels. And in the case of Monolith, I feel like the retro aesthetic actually adds to the gameplay. The reason for that is because where the character model of a bullet ends and where your ship starts, because you're flying a tiny spaceship, obviously, is, uh, is very clear because there are no lighting effects or lens flares or oddities that can, that can muddy the idea of where you can be. So you can slide past with a pixel to spare a bullet and not get hit. And you know exactly where that is. You know the edges of all the things that can hurt you. And that really helps. Also, you hitting things is very clear as well. Like, your bullet can slide past something by a single pixel, and you don't go, bullshit, I hit that. You know you didn't, and that's all because of the aesthetic they've chosen. The aesthetic is beautiful. It's got that weird, chunky pixel, low-color palette that you expect from something like a Commodore 64. While not actually being that retro, it certainly does give you that visual vibe. It certainly looks like that, and it's inspired by that. Um, definitely a game worth checking out and I think if you're a fan of bullet hell shooters at all you'll appreciate how tight the controls are on this game and how how much you can get better at it with a very small playing session like when I first started playing I was terrible and within an hour I was blazing through levels and I was really having a great time not to say it's easy but that visual clarity allows you to really sort of hone your skills with it which is wonderful and uh, monolith uh, is published by team d13 and developed by team d13 gets very very positive overall on steam and recently and it's priced at five pound 59 which is a very humble amount of money for a game that i really really love to play Thank you for watching. Hopefully you've enjoyed it. And hopefully those have gone back in your head hole now and you're going to go off and play some awesome games. But if they're not back in your head hole for any reason and if there's stuff that you're like, hey, I didn't, I don't, there's some other stuff that's better than that. You tell me, dudes. That's what the comment section's for. In fact, don't just tell me. Mention things that other people would like. Tell each other. Let's have that conversation down there. Uh, if you enjoyed this video, please press the like button. That does help me out quite a bit, actually. And if you press subscribe, you'll you'll see me in your inbox again. I do this a lot. This is this is what the, the channel is, pretty much. Uh, and me playing random games weirdly. Um, anyway, <laughs> anyway uh, don't forget you can support me on Patreon as well if you're so inclined. I also tweet and stream. That stuff happens as well. Bye, guys.